Thanks again for attending and um, this webinar is going to be recorded and placed on the program's YouTube channel um, so you can go ahead and reference it uh, at any time. Just a few little housekeeping items here. Um, if you haven't attended a GoToWebinar before, uh, we have everybody in listen-only mode at this time. Um, so please um, feel free if you have questions to enter them into the chat box uh, that'll be on one of the uh, pop-ups under the GoToWebinar. Um, we will at the very end open it up to questions live on the phone. So uh, there will be a audio pin uh, right here listed in the GoToWebinar pane. Please enter that into your phone, and at the end, once we unmute, uh, you will be able to answer questions that way. Uh, but in the meantime, we will stop at the end of each of the sections that are covered today and ask questions that are typed into the chat. Uh, so feel free to add those there, and we will get them answered um, as we go. Today we're going to cover uh, a brief overview of the program, um, how to participate in the program as a program partner, how to submit uh, jobs or projects to the program. Uh, we'll also cover the assessment and modeling requirements for the program, and also the combustion safety requirements, which um, some, some items have changed for this year, so we'll highlight those. Um, we'll also talk about what training and mentoring is going to be offered this year and also give you some additional resources to use um, throughout the program if you have any questions. So to get rolling, um, this is just a reminder that um, this is a um, program that is funded by the California Utility Customers and it's administered by the Pacific Gas and Electric Company um, under the California Public Utility Commission. Uh, therefore, funding is limited and um, it is um, at all times subject to change or termination without prior notice. Um, so just wanted to make everyone aware this program is a um, you know, voluntary program and um, is subject to change at any time. Uh, attendance in this webinar is not guaranteed participation in the multifamily upgrade program, uh, nor does it guarantee you will work on a participating project. Um, so strictly attending this webinar um, is one of the requirements to become a participating rater in the pro rater or contractor in the program. Um, and it's not TRC or PG&E's role to handle or execute any contracts between partners and uh, property owners. Uh, that is your role as the partner or contractor. The eligibility for the program is unchanged um, from 2015. Um, it is available to all PG&E customers. Uh, this includes customers that do receive a single commodity from PG&E, um, so receiving just gas or just electric. Uh, we have had several pr projects in the past that are in the SMUD and SoCal gas territory also participate in the program. Um, if you do have projects that are in um, to utility territories, uh, please contact the program and we'll help you, you know, go through that process of participating in both programs. The minimum uh, requirement is 10% energy savings above existing conditions and this is um, as similar to last year based on a whole building energy model. Properties that are five or more units are eligible for the multifamily program. Um, anything four units or less are um, eligible for the single family um, upgrade program, uh, which is also through PG&E. Um, that program is administered uh, through Build It Green. Project properties that have two to four unit buildings that are part of a larger complex um, are eligible for either the single family or the multifamily program. So if you have any properties that kind of fall into that two to four unit um, category and there's multiple buildings like that on site, uh, please just give the program staff uh, here at TRC a call and we can help you to um, decide which, you know, which options are best for the customer and help walk through the, um, 
benefits or disadvantages of each of the program and, and what will work best for them. Um, if there are any new construction projects, um, those will go through the California Multifamily New Homes Program. Um, that program is also administered by TRC, um, and you can go to the CMFNH website for more information there, or contact one of your program um, staff, and we're, we're happy to help direct you to that program. The program is also um, available for um, all property types, affordable, mixed income, and market rates. It also includes high-rise and low-rise properties. And the program requires that the building owner hire a qualified rater and contractor, which is all of you folks uh, here on the phone call today. And it also requires that there are upgrades from two or more unique measure categories. Um, so you can see on the bottom that includes envelope, lighting appliances, HVAC, and domestic hot water. Um, and the measures that are listed on the screen are some of the most common measures that are seen. Um, we have had some other measures participate in the program. Um, so if you don't see a measure listed um, here or in the program handbook, which we'll go over in a little bit, um, feel free to contact the program staff and we can help you determine if that's an eligible measure for the program. The goal for 2016 is 2,000 dwelling units. Um, and the timeline for the program is uh, January 2016 through November 2016. So um, the program is still running on a yearly basis. So um, some of the, the key deadlines to keep in mind for the program are that enrollment um, and projects have to pass an assessment um, by October 1st of 2016. Um, and then the last hard deadline for 2016 is construction and completion documentation uh, must be submitted by November 15th, 2016 to the program. Um, this, the program does have strict completion deadlines and the incentives are subject to change if deadlines are not met. Um, so please keep in mind October 1st as the enrollment and um, pass assessment review deadline, and then also number 15th for all upgrades and verification documentation to be turned into the program. Uh, the incentives for 2016 are unchanged from last year. So it is uh, incentives start at a minimum of $600 per unit at 10% energy savings. Um, they scale up 1% uh, from there. Uh, the maximum incentive um, per unit is $2,250 um, at 50% uh, energy improvement over existing conditions. Um, similar to last year, these are based on modeled energy savings using Energy Pro. And the project is paid at completion. Um, that means that all upgrades have been completed and the project has passed program verification review. Um, similar to last year, the owner is able to sign over the um, upgrade incentive to the participating contractor conducting the upgrade work. Um, that is a field on the program application. Um, so if you have owners uh, that would like to have the incentive go straight to the participating contractor, uh, make sure they do check that box on the application. The assessment incentives are also unchanged for 2016. Um, these are designed to be an offset of uh, the assessment cost. They are set at $100 per unit. There is a $25 bonus available to projects um, that are achieving 25% or greater uh, savings. Um, and the in assessment incentives are capped at $20,000 for example, um, if there's 200, if there's a project with over 200 units, the assessment incentive would um, be capped at $20,000, um, and that does include the um, the $25 bonus per unit. And similar to the upgrade incentive, the assessment incentive is paid at completion to the owner at the completion of the project. And the owner does have the opportunity to sign over the incentive to the rate of performing the field assessment, modeling, and verification. Um, as I mentioned before, that is a field on the application. 
um, and should be checked at time that the application is filled out by the owner. The program does have a um, new participation path for 2016. Um, this is something that we piloted in 2015 with a several projects. Um, we're, we are calling this the incremental um, path. So the way that this path works is um, it has a few different requirements than the regular mainstream program. Um, the first similar uh, requirement is that there is a minimum 10% uh, energy savings above existing conditions, which is the same as the mainstream program. Um, projects that are looking to participate in this path do have to have a minimum of 100 units, and they also have to have both PG&E gas and electric. So unfortunately, no single commodity projects are um, allowed to participate in this program path. Um, space is limited, so if you do have a project that is interested in participating in this path, please contact the program staff to see if there's availability um, for your project. Um, and the way that this program path works is that um, the projects are split into um, phases. So there's a maximum of five completion phases, and the this is designed for properties that are upgrading unit by unit or upgrading by measure across the property. So properties that are um, doing upgrades building by building are not eligible for this program path and should go through the regular uh, multifamily upgrade path. Um, but if they are completing a certain percentage of units um, in phases or doing all upgrade measures um, in phases such as windows or refrigerators um, at one, excuse me, in one, one phase at a time, um, they're eligible to participate in this program. Um, the way that the incentives work for this program are that um, they are estimated energy savings for each phase's scope of work. Um, so for example, if a project is um, completing windows, lighting, and domestic wa hot water upgrades, and their first phase, they're just doing all of the domestic hot water um, upgrades. So that would be phase one. That would be, um, we would parse out what the estimated energy savings are for upgrading the domestic hot water um, throughout the entire property. And then um, we would base the incentive um, for that phase one off of those um, energy savings. And then
All right, we will move on. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them into the chat in the GoToWebinar pane, and we will get those uh, answered as soon as possible. So partner participation in the program, um, we appreciate everyone that participates in the program and um, are uh, doing putting in mechanisms in place to make this as, um, a beneficial um, partnership um, with all of the raiders and contractors in the program. Um, several of the benefits to becoming a um, approved program partner are um, each company that is approved is listed on the program website. And also, um, there are several industry trainings that are offered through the program, um, either through our monthly emails. Um, we also are putting together a um, extensive training program for 2016 that will um, focus not only just on the um, requirements of the multifamily upgrade program, but also um, the um, other industry trainings. Uh, the program also offers technical assistance to raiders and contractors that are participating in the program. Um, this is free assistance if you have questions about modeling or, um, you know, specifications for upgrades. Um, the program staff is here to help um, answer those questions. For 2016, we also developed a um, program marketing toolkit for all of the um, eligible contractors and raiders. Uh, a few of the sort of highlights of this are um, the program has developed uh, marketing language that is uh, available to all approved partners. Um, and this is um, a toolkit that the program will be sending out um, to all of the eligible partners um, here in the next few weeks. Um, in addition to the marketing language that can be posted on your website, the program is also offering a digital button which will link to the program website. And examples of these buttons are here on the right-hand um, side of the um, screen. Um, Mike, I think you're unmuted. If you could just mute your line, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, these digital buttons, um, we will send them to you in a zip file, and you're able to place them on your website. Um, so this is for the program year 2016, um, and indicates that you are participating raider or contractor in the program. And um, the third piece of the marketing toolkit is a customizable flyer. So this is something that the program has designed, and um, we will send this out to all of the participating partners with your company name that is listed on the website, um, placed into um, these portions here, where um, the um, you know partner company and name, um, email address, website is um, all highlighted here. Um, so we will fill this in for you and send that on over. And this is something that um, please feel free to pass out to um, potential clients um, to participate in the program. <clears throat> Steph. Yes. Hey, it's Mike. Sorry, I dropped off the call for a little while because we're um, blessed and cursed to be having this wonderful storm today. Um, but we do have a couple questions that came in uh, that I'd like to bring up um, Okay, great. Now. Thank you. So the first question is, would 25% energy savings result in a $120, $25 per unit assessment incentive? Yes, that is correct. Um, so the base incentive is $100 per unit, and if you achieve 25% energy savings or better, um, an additional $25 is tacked on to that. So the total assessment incentive for any project going over 25% energy savings would be $125 per unit. Great. Uh, the next question is asking for clarification on the incremental eligibility approach. So can you talk a little bit more about what are some of the scenarios uh, that best suit clients or what, what kinds of clients would be best suited for the incremental approach? 
Most definitely. Um, great question. So um, the what we've seen participating in the pilot program um, for 2015 were um, clients that are um, interested in participating in the program um, but have a little bit longer timeline uh, than just the you know 2016 program year. Um, so let's say they're they're starting in July of this year but won't be finished till July of next year, um, and they're finishing it on a unit by unit basis. So as units turn over, um, they're doing the upgrades when the tenants are moving out and before the new tenants are moving in. So they're not going through the property and um, completing the upgrades all at once. Um, in addition, we had a few projects also participate that um, uh, needed some assistance with cash flow. So um, the phased approach is really helpful for that because instead of waiting till all of the upgrades are complete um, in the end to get the incentive, the incentive is issued based on um, you know, however the um, project is set up. So whether it's they're finishing 50% of their units by November of this year and then 50% of units next year, um, or if, like I said it before, if they're completing one measure at a time, um, the uh, incentives are issued um, on a phase level there. So um, it's, it's helpful for projects that um, have some cash flow issues um, to get assistance with that, to get uh, incentives um, quicker than just uh, waiting until the, the very final phase. And, and one other question to sort of tie into what you were just saying, are the regular incentives paid by phase as well or all at the end? Um, in the regular mainstream um, multifamily upgrade program, which is a building by building program, um, that one is um, all of the uh, upgrade and assessment incentives are paid at project completion. It's all upgrades and verification is complete. And then for the incremental path, um, the, the incentives are paid by phase, right? That is correct. Um, so if you have more questions, if you have projects that are interested in the incremental path, um, feel free to call any of our program staff and we're happy to you know, talk about the um, customer's scenario and see if they're a good candidate for the program. We're, we're more than happy to help determine if, if that's the correct approach for them or not. And one other question, does TRC provide Support for or approved calculator tool for the low flow fixture calculations? Um, that is a great question. Um, we currently do not have um, a calculator tool necessarily um, developed at this point. That is something on our to do list for 2016. Um, right now, for low flow fixtures, um, the energy savings. Um, and calculations are in the energy division work paper. Um, and we will be creating a tool to help our partners um, through that, but the work paper is, um, you have to do a little bit of digging to find out the energy savings and, and uh, the, the entire calculation. Um, but the program staff is happy to help walk through partners um, through that process. And like I said, we. Um, we'll be developing something here in 2016, um, and we will notify everyone when that is available. Great. That's it for now on the questions. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, so jumping back into partner qualifications, um, most of the folks on the phone call today are returning um, program partners. Um, but if you are not a returning program partner, um, I'll just quickly highlight what the qualifications are. Um, the first one is that you attend the uh, orientation, which you guys are all um, on right now. Um, additionally, all of the uh, license certification and insurance um, requirements must be satisfied. And lastly, um, the contractor radar agreement must be si reviewed, signed, um, and uh, 
that was sent out to all of the past participants in the program. Um, if you are a new participant in the program, um, we will um, we'll send out an email reminder to everybody on this call today of um, what the requirements are for the program and a really uh, easy checklist to help you um, get all of that information into the program. Um, so just to highlight what the rater qualifications are for the program, um, there are um, the mainstream requirements for all low waste projects and there are some additional requirements for any partner that is um, bringing a high-rise project to the program. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The um, partner qualifications um, uh, here listed on the screen are, um, you know, typical industry qualifications um, for most raters participating in um, utility programs, uh, if they require um, such re requirements. Um, so if anybody has any questions about um, any of these certifications or requirements or, um, you know, interested in learning how to get some of these requirements, um, please contact uh, the multifamily program and we're happy to assist you with um, determining uh, if you're eligible and um, also where you can get um, certified under any of these um, certifications. Um, for participating contractors, um, there are um, the there are three different um, qualifications that are eligible for the program. Um, the first is the um, General A Engineering License. Uh, the second is the uh, General Building Contractor B License, um, and any specialty contractors um, designated as a um, a C license um, are eligible. For to be listed as a program participant as well. Um, a few things to note, uh, contractors uh, must ensure that the work is performed by appropriately licensed, certified, and insured subcontractors. Um, so if you're a general contractor, um, you, you know, need to make sure that all of your subcontractors are um, appropriately licensed and certified um, and insured to um, conduct the work. Um, and general contractors accept the responsibility to review all subcontractor licenses, certification, and employees. Um, so the program will not be collecting um, any general contractors' uh, subcontractor licenses um, unless um, requested. Um, so that is up to the general contractor to provide that. Uh, the insurance requirements for the program are unchanged from last year. Um, so, raters and contractors um, both have requirements for um, general liability um, for bodily injury, property damage, and personal injury. Um, and those uh, those limits are listed there on the right-hand column. Um, there's also requirements for um, business and personal automotive um, liability, workers' compensation. And also, um, uh, there is no requirement for um, professional liability errors or omissions. Um, lastly, insurance certificates are required for the program and are due within 30 days of signing the rater or contractor agreement. Um, so if you have any questions about the insurance requirements, please feel free to reach out to the MUP um, staff. Um, our staff, Michelle Waffle, is the staff that um, you probably all have received emails from, and um, she's happy, happy to walk you through any of the requirements if you have any questions. Um, lastly, for um, eligibility, um, all of the partners are um, required to verify that um, you have a security background check policy in place for all of your employees. Um, for completion requirements, uh, please refer to the contractor and rater participation agreement for the program. Uh, this is listed out uh, for, for any eligible participant. Um, and contractors and raters are not eligible to participate until this requirement is met um, and risk losing eligibility in the program if the requirement is not maintained. Um, so please uh, refer to the contractor and rater participation agreement and uh, make sure you do have a security background check policy in place for your company um, to be eligible in the program. 
Uh, Mike, I'm going to open it up to any questions before we move on to the next section um, for any of the partner eligibility requirements. Great. <clears throat> there is one question uh, regarding energy efficiency measures within a single project. Can buildings use different measures? Um, so I think I, I'm kind of reading between the lines here, but I think the person, and feel free to clarify your question, is asking um, can can different buildings, can building A install domestic hot water and building B install um, insulation? Is that eligible within the program? I believe is the question. Please clarify if I'm missing that. Okay, great. Um, so because this program is a building by building program, um, not a property level program, the program does require that there are two, a minimum of two measures um, being upgraded in each building. Um, so that participating um, scenario that Mike listed out um, would not be eligible for the program unless they were doing two measures um, on each of the buildings. Um, and as Mike said, if if that wasn't um, the intent of the question, please please do clarify, and we're happy to answer it. Okay. And one other question: uh, If an upgrade measure such as uh, such as HVAC upgrade requires HERS testing, which is duct testing or refrigerant charge testing, can we still reflect those HERS tests as upgrade measures? Um, the answer to that is um, no. So um, the program does allow um, duct leakage to be claimed if it is tested at test in and test out. And those requirements are listed in the um, program handbook. Um, other HERS measures are not eligible for the program. Great, thanks. And I think we got clarification on the first question that we just talked about, so um, I think we're, we're good to move on, but feel free to clarify or ask additional questions in chat if we missed your, the gist of your question. Great, thank you. Um, so I just want to quickly um, do a high-level overview of um, what it, the process is to um, submit a project into the program. Um, so pre Pre-qualification um, is a, the opportunity for um, the contractor owner, uh, Raider, and um, MUP staff to all be on a phone call together and kind of just talk about, get basic project information, um, which kind of includes um, you know existing conditions, um, what the planned upgrades are, their time frame, what their financing looks like. Um, and this is a free service that's offered by the program. Um, so please feel free to uh, reach out to program staff if you have a uh, interested project that you'd like to go through pre-qualification. Um, this will kind of help us help you um, determine if it's a, a project that is eligible in the program. Um, alternatively, we do have a lot of customers that come directly to the program that are interested um, in participating. And we have this conversation up front with them, and um, once we have um, decided that it's an eligible project for the program, we do reference, uh, we do have the customer then um, go to the program website and um, call several different uh, raters or contractors um, to get different bids for the job. Uh, secondly, after the, the project is eligible for the program, uh, the application process begins. Um, and this is when the property owner selects their project team, uh, so the rater and approved contractor as well. Um, this is when uh, we do need all of the participating rater and contractor um, certification agreements and insurance information turned in um, before we can officially enroll the project into the program. Uh, the third step in the process is then to um, conduct the uh, assessment for the building. And this is where the program rater will um, conduct the on-site assessment um, and follow all of the program rules and sampling requirements, which includes combustion safety testing. 
The fourth process, uh, step in the process, excuse me, is the desktop review. So that is once your assessment is complete on site, um, you've prepared all of your documents for the program, and you submit all of your documents through the partner portal, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, and that is um, the port in which the program then reviews all the documentation that's submitted by the, the rater. Um, and this is uh, a process meant to make sure that the you know, project is meeting the program requirements, um, that all of the um, building energy models are built to existing conditions, and also the specifications for the upgrades um, are making sense. And um, one new requirement this year for the program is that um, after the partner rater has submitted the uh, test-in package to the program. Once it's reviewed, we will go ahead and schedule a live assessment review with the participating um, project rater um, to just go over if there's any revisions or talk through any special calculations that um, the rater is looking to um, add into the project. Um, and this is really meant to be um, just a conversation um, to help get the project to, um, to incentive reservation um, much quicker. Um, so after the uh, assessment, the project has completed assessment, the program will reserve the incentive. Um, the incentive is not reserved until this point. So the application, all the contractor and rater documentation, and it has to pass the assessment review process. Um, then at that point, the incentive is, is reserved. Um, uh, then next, the uh, installation of all the upgrades occur. And once all of the upgrades occur, the verification performed by the rater um, is to verify that all of the proper measures were installed and the project is passing all of the combustion safety tests. At that point, the rater will submit all of the verification documentation to the program. Um, and please refer always to the program handbook for all of the requirements for the verification process. Um, once that, once the project has passed verification from the on-site and also um, desktop review of the program, um, then the incentive um, will be requested to pay, be paid by PG&E. Uh, so that's just a really quick overview of how the, the program process works. Uh, if you have any questions, um, the process is laid out and all the documentation that is needed is laid out in the partner handbook. So please feel free to refer to that um, and also call program staff or email us if you have any questions. Mike, are there any questions about the process at all before I move on? No, no new questions have come in. Okay, great. Um, so all of the assessment requirements um, are similar to last year. Um, the uh, assessment really consists of a sampling of the dwelling units, and this is based on the Multifamily Home Energy Retrofit Coordinating Council, um, also known as the HERC uh, recommendations. Um, so please refer to the program handbook for detailed requirements um, of the sampling plan. Um, just a quick brief overview of what we're looking for in the assessment report. Um, which is required by the program, and um, this is a, a report that helps us um, understand what is um, occurring at the site, what the existing conditions are, what the proposed um, upgrades are, and um, also documents things in photographical format as well. Um, so the brief outline here um, of what are the different require, required um, sections of that report. Um, and if you would like any examples of um, assessment reports, um, Google is a great resource actually um, to type in um, assessment report or um, ASHRAE level two report. Um, that also will kind of give you a good idea of um, you know what is required in in each of these sections. The model requirements for the program are unchanged from last year. We are still using Energy Pro version five. For low-rise projects, it will be the residential performance module. For high-rise projects, it will be the non-residential performance model. 
um, module, excuse me. If you have any questions, um, uh, please call the program staff. Um, if you're not sure which module to use, um, all low-rise projects are three or less stories, and high-rise projects are four or more stories. The 10% improvement is based on whole building um, energy model savings. Um, this includes common areas such as lobbies, corridors, et cetera. Um, if upgrades are being um, done in common areas, um, uh, those are eligible to be included in the models. Um, the program does require that one model per building is submitted. Um, because this is a building by building program and not a property level program, um, the incentives are issued on a building per building um, basis. So one model per building um, is, uh, is the only acceptable modeling method at this time. Um, if you have questions about that, please feel free to contact program staff. Um, side calculations and custom measures um, are accepted on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so if you do have um, something that can't be modeled in Energy Pro and are doing a acceptable engineering calculation um, or are interested in a custom measure such as low flow fixtures um, that can't be modeled in the alternatives tabs in Energy Pro, um, please contact the program staff um, to see eligibility. Um, there are several resources out there um, through the California Energy Commission that have uh, many of the approved work papers listed for custom measures. Um, and uh, please feel free to always contact program staff if you have any questions, um, if it's an eligible measure. Um, we do encourage you, if you have side calculations or custom measures that um, you have not brought through the program before, please do contact program staff um, you know, ahead of time to um, make sure that's an eligible uh, measure or calculation in the program. Um, we will review these measures and calculations, and um, they will also be vetted by PG&E. So um, because um, things that are not eligible to model within alternative tabs in Energy Pro, um, these, these types of measures may take a little bit more time to get approved. So um, when they come up, please, please bring program staff's attention early on so we can get that process started. Uh, Mike, do we have any questions about the assessment or um, energy modeling at all? Uh, yes, one question is about, is it site savings or TDV savings, uh, ten, the 10% threshold? Great question, and thank you for asking that. Um, it is site savings. So the pg e program is based on site savings. And that's it for now. Okay, great. All right, so we'll move into the combustion safety requirements for the program. Um, there are a few different changes um, here for combustion safety in 2016. Uh, we have highlighted those here in bold on the slides. Um, all other requirements um, are unchanged. Um, however, I do want to caveat that um, we, we are active on um, several different committees here in California and on the national level. And as um, program, as requirements change in those, we try to align them with um, the program as well. So um, we will be updating those um, as frequently as possible in the um, partner handbook. And we'll be notifying project partners of any updates um, when those are released. Um, one of the requirements that was also a requirement last year um, is that when you are scheduling your test-in, um, combustion safety testing, um, please notify the program staff five business days in advance of testing. This allows us to contact pg and &E and um, notify them that you'll be conducting um, combustion safety testing at projects. Um, this is a process that um, if you notify the program that um, you're going to be going testing, we can notify pg and &E and um, sometimes they will have their staff um, come on site and um, if they're available. Um, other times, um, they'll just notify that there is a raider in the area performing testing this day 
and um, you know just give them a heads up that um, you know they might be receiving calls from this address. Um, if you ever have any issues on site um, where a PG&E gas service representative um, is called um, and you need assistance, um, you know, getting through or um, contacting PG&E, uh, if you're not able to call their 1-800 number and get through, please call the program staff um, and we're happy to be the liaison for that. Um, one other requirement in the program um, that was changed midway last year was um, now central combustion equipment um, can be done based on a sampling plan, um, which is here on the right hand side of the screen, this table. Um, this is the same uh, sampling plan that is um, used for um, the number of units um, for the property. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, a unit sampling with um, the plant upgrades for combustion equipment um, or pressure dynamic changes um, is here on the right hand side. Um, so, if any of the pressure dynamics um, within the units are changing, such as you know, windows or adding insulation, combustion safety is required um, in those units. Um, one requirement that is new for 2016 is that if um, carbon monoxide alarms are present and working, and the scope of work includes a combustion appliance, that appliance does not need to be tested at test-in. So for example, if there are um, in-unit individual domestic hot water systems that are part of the scope of work, and there is a working CO alarm in the units, that particular appliance does not need to be tested at test-in. Um, if for some reason, though, the um, domestic hot water in this example is value engineered out of the scope of work, um, that will need to be tested at test-in. Um, so that is one new requirement for the program. Um, combustion safety test out requirements. Um, once again, we do ask that you notify the program staff uh, five business days in advance of the testing so we can notify PG&E. Uh, it is 100% of dwelling units must be tested and 100% of common area equipment. Um, so, uh, you know, multi-purpose rooms, um, areas like that where um, it's a common area used by tenants, 100% of that equipment must be tested. Um, additionally, participants must submit all documentation of the combustion safety testing and results for all units and equipment. Um, and this is something that is required in the assessment report. Um, we do require that you summarize your testing results and also provide the um, actual testing results um, from each of the units and equipment that are, that are tested. A few exclusions do apply in the program. Uh, combustion equipment that is located completely outside of the building envelope, um, such as um, rooftop package units that are not accessible, um, are not, uh, you do not have to be tested. And also new ovens and ranges installed as part of the upgrade do not require testing at test out either. Um, all of the combustion safety requirements are listed in the program handbook, and um, there are uh, a few other exclusions um, eligible in the program, but please refer to the program handbook for that. Um, so there are a few times when a um, gas service representative from PG&E um, uh, does need to be contacted. Um, and these are um, also listed in the program handbook. And feel free to call the program staff if you need support um, on determining if the gas service representative needs to be called um, or getting a hold of someone to address the issues. A few other requirements in the program for combustion safety testing. Um, these are um, BPI combustion action levels, and um, there's a few additional PG&E required actions um, and, and when to call the gas service representative in the right-hand column. Um, these are unchanged from the 2015 program, um, and if you have any questions on any of the requirements at any time, please always call program staff, and we're happy to walk you through it. 
Mike, do we have any other questions on combustion safety before we move on? <clears throat> yes, got a couple questions. Um, Great. How are savings for measures that are not easily attributed to a specific building, such as pool measures or part property level lighting or leasing office upgrades? Um, how how are those split between buildings? How are, how are the savings and incentive values? Great. So um, it depends on what the scenario is. Um, so I'll give you one example for um, pool pumps, um, which is an eligible measure in the program. Um, we recommend that um, that energy savings be be associated with the largest building on, on the property. Um, in the partner handbook, we do have modeling guidelines that will walk you through um, how to include that into the model. Um, there are also several different scenarios in the energy modeling guidelines um, that can help you determine um, property level um, upgrades as well. Um, there are quite a few different scenarios um, that I'm not going to go into um, on the call today. Um, but I'll give you one other quick example, um, which is exterior lighting that's not attached to the building. Um, this is entered into the exterior uses tab into Energy Pro. Um, and so that's an external calculation that you would do. Um, and that would be divided up by all of the buildings um, on site and added into the exterior uses tab. Um, so if there are specific questions about um, kind of custom measures like that that can't be um, easily modeled in the alternatives tab or a property level, um, please do contact program staff and we're happy to walk you through it. Um, and like I said, another resource is also the program handbook. Great. Uh, next question. If there are no measures affecting the pressure dynamics, is CAS testing still required at test in? Uh Great question. So if there are no um, changes in the pressure dynamics of the um, units, um, CAS testing at testing is not required. Great. Um, what if we do not have five days lead time? Will we still be able to conduct CAS? Um, absolutely. Um, so we we have asked that um, partners notify us um, five business days, um, just sort of as a um, a courtesy, so we can give PG and E enough heads up. Um, as you know, their gas service representatives are very busy and on calls all the time. Um, so it's nice for them to know, um, you know, if they might have additional calls coming in that day. Um, if, uh, you know, you schedule a, a site visit for, you know, three days out, um, please just let us know and we're, we will communicate that to PG&E. Um, but please do your best to um, schedule, schedule things at least five business days out so we can notify PG&E. Is there a protocol for verifying that a CO alarm is working? Um, that is a good question. And Mike, please um, speak up if, if I don't have this correct. Um, generally, on smoke detectors and CO alarms, there is a test button um, that uh, the user can press and verify that the unit is working. Is that in alignment with um, your understanding, Mike? Yeah, so we want you to test the CO alarm, but also there's an expectation that you have CO testing equipment with you while doing the site visit. Um, that's a personal CO ambient monitor alarm as well as a point CO combustion analyzer uh, piece of equipment. So those pieces of equipment in, in conjunction should be able to tell you whether or not there is carbon monoxide present in the apartment and then the test procedure can tell you whether or not the actual alarm mechanism of that piece of equipment is working. We should document that though. So we'll put together the protocol, the expectation for for what we mean when we say that a carbon monoxide monitor should be installed and working, and we will um, get that to the park. Great, thanks for that clarification. Jeff, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. 
Okay, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we'll move on. Uh, we are reaching um, the hour limit here soon, so um, there's just, uh, I believe, two more sections that we'll go over really quickly. Um, we wanted to cover what the um, continuing education requirements are for the program. Um, Raiders are required to complete continuing education training. Uh, the program does not require contractors to complete training. Um, however, we, we highly encourage um, participating contractors to attend any of the trainings. Um, oftentimes, we'll provide program updates um, and also um, you know, update uh, eligible measures or custom measures um, that are eligible for the program. So um, contractors are, are um, definitely welcome at any of the trainings that are offered by the program. Uh, program readers um, are required to take a minimum of four hours of training every program year and attend all of the quarterly program update meetings. Um, the program does allow raiders um, to receive outside industry trainings. However, three of the four hours for continuing education um, required uh, must come from the multifamily upgrade program. Um, all of the trainings that are offered um, through the program on a webinar basis are um, recorded and will be posted on the program's YouTube page. So they will be offered um, outside of the date that they're actually hosted as well. Um, so there will definitely be ample um, availability of all of the trainings. Um, the Multifamily Upgrade YouTube channel um, also has all of the trainings from last year as well which partners are welcome to um, attend and use those as their four hours of, of program training. Uh, for more information, please just uh, refer to the partner handbook um, for, for all of the requirements. Um, I should uh, also add that um, the program will be hosting a quarterly kind of update um, meetings for program contractors and raiders. And this is an opportunity for um, us to kind of communicate, you know, how the program is doing, um, you know, uh, how many projects are enrolled, how, you know, how close we are to the goals of the program. Um, and so we, those, those meetings are required for um, the partner raiders um, and encouraged um, for all of the partner contractors in the program. Um, currently, our training series for 2016 is under development, um, but we wanted to highlight some of the um, high-level uh, training series that we're um, currently developing. Um, similar to last year, we will also be doing a technical topics series, which will be web-based. Um, this will um, have um, several different technical topics, such as energy modeling, um, you know, use of the low flow calculator, um, tool that's under development, um, those are opportunities to um, kind of learn about um, special calculations and um, uh, modeling. Secondly, operations and maintenance is another um, training track that is under development. Um, this will be a training um, for raiders and contractors to participate in and also um, property owners and maintenance staff. Um, this will be a combination of web and site-based training. And once that is fully developed, um, we will um, announce the training schedule for that um, and get folks signed up. Um, and thirdly, um, another training that's under development is asset management uh, training. And this will also be a web-based um, training as well. So once all of um, the training series are uh, developed, we will announce the, the schedule to um, everyone via the program portal and also um, via email. Um, just a caveat, these um, technical trainings, operations maintenance, and asset trains are subject to change, um, and the final schedule will be posted on the program portal. Um, and lastly, as I had highlighted before, all the web-based trainings will be recorded and posted on the YouTube channel. Um, to access the YouTube channel, you can go to the program website, um, multifamilyupgrade.com, and under the resources page, there's a link to the YouTube channel. Uh, alternatively, you can go directly to YouTube and type in PG&E Multifamily Upgrade, and that'll bring you to uh, the program website with all of the trainings listed. 
Um, I'm just going to go through this last um, bit of slides, and then I'll open it up um, for for more questions. Um, so we'll hold any questions for that section um, at the end of this next section here. Um, a few program resources for folks out there. Um, the program handbooks. There are two handbooks. One is the customer handbook, and the supplemental to that is the program rater and contractor handbook. Um, these are documents for reference um, to the program requirements. Um, and um, as updates change um, those requirements, we will notify um, folks via email and through the program par portal. Um, if you cannot find an answer to one of your questions in any of the handbooks um, or on the program website, please call or email Mike Maroney or myself, um, Stephanie at TRC, or any of the program staff that you have been working with um, in the past or present. Uh, we're happy to you know, get your questions answered. Uh, the partner portal is something I've referenced a few times um, throughout this call, um, and this is a, um, a secure portal that is um, accessible to all approved um, partners and contractors in the program. Um, here is a snapshot of what the partner portal looks like. Um, there are a few different resources on here. Um, we have a news feed that um, will give you, you know, the most updates on, you know, if there's new versions of handbooks out. Um, we will post um, also uh, events and um, uh, different trainings that are going to be held. Um, you can also access the projects um, through the partner portal as well, through the My, My Projects tab. Um, and that will list um, the, the projects that have submitted applications um, for your um, excuse me, it'll list the um, projects that have submitted application um, that list you as the rater. And um, this is where you'll also submit all of your documentation for the program for test in and test out. Um, the program is moving to um, strictly accepting program documents through the partner portal. Um, we, as security is getting tighter and tighter, um, we um, are asking that everyone please submit um, all documents to the portal. If you have, if you don't see a project listed um, under your name um, on the portal, please contact program staff and we will um, make sure that um, that project goes live for you. Um, and also, if for some reason um, something isn't working or you get an error message on the portal, um, please just take a screenshot and send it to the program and, and we'll make sure that that gets um, addressed. Um, there are links to the application on the portal as well, um, so you can copy that and send it to customers um, or get the application started for them as well. Um, there will be a link to the trainings and also under the protocols tab, um, that is where we'll list um, any of the calculator tools um, or also um, the, excuse me, the um, partner handbooks as well. So the next steps um, to uh, completing your uh, approval process for the 2016 program, um, the first was to attend this orientation, which all of you are done, and um, we will uh, take the attendee list for this and um, mark everyone that you've completed this orientation who attended the call. Um, we do encourage you to have other staff on your um, on your staff attend the uh, orientation, which will be posted on the um, YouTube page um, here within the next few days. Um, lastly, make sure all the copies of your certifications and insurance are um, in and submitted to the program. You can email that to multifamilyupgrade at trcsolutions.com. Um, and then. Uh, Thirdly, uh, you must review the assessment and modeling trainings on the YouTube channel. Um, these are unchanged from last year. Um, so if you did watch them last year, um, you know, we'll mark those as done. However, we highly encourage you to watch them again as a refresher. Um, there are a few things in those two um, trainings um, that have not been updated for the program year 2016. Um, so please always um, check the most current program rules found in the program handbook, uh, and those can be found, like I said, on the program portal. 
And lastly, make sure you sign your partner agreement and submit that to the program as well. And um, once all of this information is in, we um, will confirm and list you on the program website. Um, if any of the uh, folks on the call today um, are new to the program um, and any of the program requirements are unclear, please shoot an email to multifamilyupgrade at trcsolutions.com and we'll send you a handy checklist to make sure um, that outlines each of the requirements for the program. Um, and then help walk you through that process. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everybody for attending the um, program webinar. Um, I am going to open it up to um, questions at this time. Um, I do want to highlight a few key staff um, on our project team and um, additional resources um, for folks to contact anyone. Um, Sophia Hartkoff is the program manager. Uh, Mike Roney is the uh, manager for training and partners, um, and Shannon Todd is our marketing outreach um, program staff a contact. Um, so if you have any specific questions, feel free to contact any of these staff or myself. Um, our program website, phone number, and email are also listed on the screen. So with that, I would like to thank everybody for attending today's um, orientation webinar. This will be posted in the next few days on the YouTube channel. Um, and Mike, I'll open it up to questions at this time. Great. So um, there are a couple other questions about combustion safety. So um, everybody feel free to stay on and, and um, work through this with us. But these are just uh, questions, kind of one-off questions. So if you feel like you have a good understanding of what the rules and requirements are, um, you know, feel free to, to take off and this stuff will be recorded as well. The first uh, sort of question, clarification, um, if we are dropping the testing requirement for a combustion appliance, which is part of the work scope, and there is a working carbon monoxide monitor, does this mean that the combustion appliance is going to be, is going to be replaced or that we, re we, can ref we can defer testing until test out? So um, kind of kind of an awkward question there, but I, I think what the what the gist of it is is if you've got a project that has a combustion appliance that you're planning to replace as part of the work scope and it's got a working carbon monoxide monitor, what is our policy? What is the program policy there? Sure. Um, so the program policy at testing, if that combustion appliance is part of the scope of work and there is a working and present uh, carbon monoxide detector, um, that particular appliance does not need to be tested at test-in. Um, as we had said before though, if for some reason um, you've conducted your test-in and the scope of work changes and that combustion appliance is no longer part of the scope of work, it does need to be tested at test-in. Great. Yep. So we have we have a few different questions and clarifications about uh, CAS testing, and we'll take them all in in specifics. But in general, I want to mention that this this policy is meant to keep the the goal of with all of our actions here is to is to keep the tenants living in a healthy apartment space. We're confident that given what we know about combustion safety testing and given what we know about these monitors as well as your your spot monitors when you do site visits, we're confident that having a carbon monoxide monitor installed will make sure to alert the tenants of an unsafe situation that they're that they're living in. And then if you are planning to replace that equipment, that you don't need to test it until you replace it so long as there is a monitor. So I'm just trying to give that context so that everybody's aware of what we're trying to get done, which is keep the apartment safe and healthy, while also making sure that we're not we're not doing overly burdensome or or not necessary testing if if that testing isn't really going to result in a in a healthier living environment. So that's generally what we're trying to get done here. Now specifically, um, there's another question about a scenario. So let's say the units have working carbon monoxide monitors. The units also have gas wall heaters and central domestic hot water boilers. 
The upgrades for this project include upgrading the central boilers and the interior unit lighting. Is CAS tested, testing required in the units at test in or test out? Um, okay, good question. Um, I just want to make sure I understood it correctly. Um, if there's only lighting being changed in the units um, and there's no pressure dynamics being changed um, within the units, um, testing is only required for those um, central unit equipment um, based on a sampling plan. Yeah, and so the central boilers, if they're attached to other living spaces, would have to go through combustion safety testing. But if they're outside, if the central boilers are in their own outside closets, um, then you would need to do combustion ventilation area confirmation calculations. Um, so, uh, but but because of the fact that you're not changing the pressure dynamics or the pieces of equipment uh, in the units and the carbon monoxide warrant monitors exist and are working, um, that's correct. The next uh, question clarification is when a working carbon monoxide alarm is verified and all combustion equipment is replaced with direct vent field combustion equipment, new, new ranges, I am also assuming the new ranges are electric, does this mean that no CAS testing is required for the project? So that's more of a question about if the piece of equipment are being replaced to sealed combustion, what are the requirements? Good question. And Mike, please um, <laughs> speak up if I misrepresent this. Um, but if they are being changed to sealed combustion and all being replaced um, with also the carbon monoxide present and working, um, there does not need to be um, the test uh, the test out. Is that right. also so, correct? Yeah, so it's a little bit vague from the question about what's going on with the ranges. Uh, typically, ranges are going to have to be required or going to have to be tested if they're gas ranges, but if they're electric ranges and all the other equipment is sealed combustion, then there wouldn't be, um, then there wouldn't be any um, uh, testing required in that specific circumstance. And we're happy to go over these circumstances with you um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. So in, in that scenario, if, you know, if, if we would get this question on a real-life project, we would just need to um, verify all of the pieces of equipment and all of the um, conditions that the appliances that you're upgrading to, um, what, what testing needs to be required for each of those. So in terms of the ranges, um, there is some feedback coming in about whether or not new ranges, new gas ranges need to be tested, and we can follow up with you um, offline about that. So taking your question at face value, we would need a little bit more information about what type of ranges to confirm with you. But in terms of sealed combustion equipment in general, yes, that's true. It doesn't need to be tested. Um, uh, that doesn't need to be tested at test out. And it, it's <laughs> sort of having a conversation on the fly here. So there's questions about whether or not new gas ranges need to be tested. Do they? And um, it's, it's our understanding that new gas ranges are not required to be tested currently. So I will follow up with you with all the partners. Uh, we will follow up with all the partners uh, after this call and confirm with um, the most up-to-date regulations about that. That is a, a piece of the regulation that I was, uh, that I'm not, not familiar with, I'm not prepared for it right now. But it's my understanding that, um, or what I can speak confidently to is about the sealed combustion piece of your question. So uh, that's what I can answer right now. And we will verify the, the new range, if new gas ranges are being installed, what kind of testing is required. And we'll follow up with you shortly after this call. Hope I didn't uh, muddy the waters too much there. Are there any other questions or clarifications about combustion safety testing? or anything else. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, one of our, um, one of my colleagues just, just 
uh, filled me in that when new ranges and ovens are installed and they are newly installed as part of the scope of work, uh, these do not need to be tested. So we can kind of close the book on that one. So getting back to the original question, if the equipment is being replaced with direct vent, sealed combustion equipment, and new ranges, uh, CAS testing would not be required so long as carbon monoxide monitors exist in the testing condition and are working. Uh, another question came in. If gas water heaters are located in, in exterior lot closets attached to the apartment unit but not opening into the unit and outside the thermal envelope, is CAS testing required? Uh, we actually have some language in there in our handbook. Uh, that speaks to this. There are some sort of predefined ground rules for how to define outside, as silly as that sounds, but um, it is important for this distinction. So there are oftentimes in garden style apartment complexes you'll find the water heater located in a closet, sort of affixed but not really connected to a building. In most cases these are considered outside, but there's specific language in our handbook that speaks to um, what what that definition is and, and what those closets, what outside closets need to be tested and what outside closets need to just have um, combustion, ventilation, air calculations and confirmations, which is just a confirmation that there's enough venting for the um, draft appliance to, to get makeup air. So in most, uh, most cases where you're confident that the closet does not connect to the living space and is located outside the thermal envelope, CAS testing is not required, but please refer to our handbook for more specifics. Um, do you have the low flow fixtures work paper and any other approved work papers referenced linked to in the partner portal? Um, we, will, we will update the partner portal this week with that information, so we'll make sure that all of the work papers, uh, program work papers are linked to from there. And we do ask though that um, whenever you're doing a new work paper, just, just let us know and keep us involved because there are um, some nuances or some caveats that, that we need to, to be involved in. What I mean by that is these work papers are defined typically by region or more specifically by city or county or climate zone. So if you're pulling the wrong numbers from the wrong region or from, um, from a work paper that was originally drafted in Southern California Edison territory, for example, you might get yourself going down the wrong path. So just, just let us know if you have any questions or if you're getting started with a new work paper and, and we'll help walk you through it. Um, so I don't see any more questions coming in on any of these issues, um, but I'll, I'll leave it open, I guess, for another minute if, if people have any other questions. Questions or clarifications? It looks like they do. Um, okay, so would a wall of an outside closet that shares a common wall to a condition space, would that need to be CAS tested? So again, um, we can talk specifically if you've got a, if you've got a wall of a project that you're picturing in your mind that you want to talk about or you got pictures of it, we can talk about it. The language in our handbook was kind of carefully poured over to try and make it as, as clear and concise as possible. The connection really is to the living space and we're trying to get back to ultimately the ground level which is keeping the tenants of these buildings um, as healthy and free of uh, indoor air contaminants as possible, including carbon monoxide. So I think the language in the handbook is pretty clear to that about if the two, if the living space is connected to the CAS uh, or the um, the outdoor closet, then it would need to be tested. Um, but if you have questions specifically about a project or generally about the language, um, I'm happy to get into it, get into it more here or or off offline. Um, here I'm just looking at the handbook now so maybe this will help with this conversation. Outdoor equipment. Combustion equipment located completely outside 
not directly connected to a living space or otherwise or space otherwise utilized by tenants and or building management. So space that's located completely outside of the building enclosure and that are not affected by pressure dynamics within the building shall undergo gas line testing and meet combustion ventilation air requirements. So hopefully that that language is clear enough. Um, and if not, you know, we're happy to we're happy to change it because ultimately we want to make it uh, make it as easy as possible. Good. Got some feedback that that makes sense. Okay. Um, one piece of feedback from the chat. We have found that CAS test-in of atmospheric equipment is very useful if the equipment is being replaced with new atmospheric combustion equipment in early identification of venting problems rather than waiting to find issues to test out. I, um, I personally wholly agree with you. Um, this is a, a, one of the attendees on our call today just, just gave this some feedback for the discussion. Um, and to be honest with all of you partners, because you're going to be having to deal with this on the ground, venting has been the major issue that we found with combustion problems in implementing this program throughout 2015. Um, the, the projects that have had issues with passing combustion safety testing or CAS testing have had issues with either a vent line that's busted, a vent line that's too small, or a vent line that's too large actually, and you can't you can't quite generate enough uh, pressure to get the, the vent working. So one of the uh, one of the partners that's on the call today has said that they found test in to be very useful. Um, to help identify that venting might need to be part of your work scope. So whether or not you want to do test in as part of the work scope is now uh, an option for you and I would strongly encourage you to consider doing that testing at test in. You don't want to be left holding the bag at test out when the owner is desperate or you know waiting anticipating their incentive from the program and we're not going to pay an incentive until we can confirm that the living, the apartment units are in safe living condition. So if it it could make economic sense for you to do some spot testing at test-in of uh, combustion safety issues so that you're aware of potential issues related to the venting system if you're planning on replacing equipment. But uh, again, it's um, it's an option that we've, we've made it an option instead of making it uh, mandatory. Conversely, what we've also found is that there's a lot of testing done at test in that's um, either not finding major issues or um, the issues would have been ultimately found and, and fixed at test out as well. So that's the impetus for this change and hopefully it's giving you, the partner, more flexibility and more power over uh, the projects, but ultimately you know, we still we still have the goal in mind of leaving these units in as safe and healthy a condition as as we can when we're done with them, while operating them in a in a more energy efficient uh, or in a, in a manner that uses less energy to achieve the same result. So, are there any other um, questions or clarifications about the combustion safety issue? I'm glad that there's been such a good conversation about it. This is a key crux and a very important aspect of our program. So thank you everyone for your feedback and for your concern. Ultimately we're you know we're trying to get energy efficiency and energy reductions installed without doing any harm. So um, thank you for you know thinking through these issues with us and, and you know poking holes in, in some of the questions and the policies that we've posed because it's it's ultimately going to make the program and the policy a lot stronger. So are there any other um, aspects that you wanted to jump in on, Steph, of any of that discussion that came in at the end there? Uh, no, I think uh, you covered it. And um, just to kind of highlight again, uh, it definitely, if uh, like Mike said, um, you know, testing is sort of the tool to determine if there are, you know, issues. Um, and uh, we found that, you know, property owners are interested in knowing if there are issues that need to be fixed um, and ultimately the incentive is designed to 
you know, help fix those issues. Um, so it's best to know uh, ahead of time uh, before, you know, too much of the work gets done. So we do highly encourage um, folks to engage um, in in good testing procedures um, and, uh, you know, going kind of above and beyond sometimes is, uh, is really helpful for projects. Uh, if there isn't any other questions, I want to thank everyone again for attending and um, we all, um, all of the program staff look forward to working with everybody this year in the program. Um, we will be announcing our first quarterly uh, program meeting um, here within the next month and um, we look forward to uh, having everyone, everyone participate in the program again this year. Uh, thanks so much and uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact us. Um, at the phone number or email um, or contact staff directly if you have our emails as well. Thanks again and uh, we'll sign off for now.